Good to see you all. Thank you for joining us this evening. For those of you online who may not know me, my name is Marta Gutman, and I'm the Dean of the Spitzer School of Architecture. And tonight, I'm delighted to welcome you to our, our spring lecture series. Sorry, I don't even know what time of year it is. <laughs> spring lecture series across the Pacific Rim, Architecture and Landscape and Translation. This is the Siami Lecture Series. It's made possible by the Spitzer Architecture Fund and by the generous support of Frank Siami, 74, who's a graduate of our school, an illustrious alum. And it's been an honor and privilege for me to work with Professor Zahao Zhang on this lecture series to co-curate it with him. And Professor Zhang is not here tonight. He's off presenting his work at an academic conference with the, with the acronym of SILA. So thank you, Zahao. So as is our want, we'll begin with our acknowledgement, our land acknowledgement and acknowledging that the Spitzer School of Architecture, grounded on the schist bedrock outcrop of Harlem, is situated upon the ancestral homeland and territory of the Muncie Lenape, Wappinger and Lequazajek peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obliged to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed the City College of New York to grow and thrive on a vibrant terrain. As designers and thinkers, we endeavor to build in ways that lead toward justice, and we are committed to working to dismantling the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. So tonight, we're very, very fortunate to have Lena Cho here, who will speak to us. Uh, the title of her talk, you can see on the screen, is climate practice from the Arctic from the Arctic field from Arctic field work. Don't want to put in an extra da there. <laughs> and I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Catherine Stephen Nordenson, director of the Landscape Architecture Program, to um, give uh, in to introduce Nina. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. I know it's a busy time of year um, and really so excited and delighted to hear this lecture by Lena this evening. Um, Lena Cho is a friend and an assistant professor, graduate program director in the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Virginia and co-director of the Arctic Design Group uh, and Utonatuck. Her research focuses on material agencies and scientific sites um, in the Arctic to examine emerging forms of landscape and landscape practice in an age of climate change. Her design research has been funded by numerous organizations such as the Anchorage Museum, the U.S. National Science Foundation, and the World Bank, and has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including at the Smithsonian National Museum of, the Ameri of American History and Venice Architectural Biennale. She has an MLA from Harvard University, and her BA is from Wellesley College. Um, climate practice from Arctic field work. Um, this is a very interesting topic to me. Um, extreme environments and amplified climate experiences in the Arctic offer what Lena calls environment and environmental historians, um, Peggy Chu and Andrew Stuhl, look at this idea of curious discord, a productive agitation of landscape pre preconceptions and design norms often formed in temperate worlds and the necessary unsettling to imagine new environmental features in an age of climate change. What I think is very interesting is this kind of scientific belt of the temperate world, or the scientists of the temperate world have been always fascinated by the extremes. And I think Lena's work takes us to the poles um, and the Arctic in particular, this idea that you can go to the very far away Arctic polar world to reconsider how you consider the, the middle uh, or the temperate world. And you know, in a similar way, I, I focus my energies at the, at the equator. And I think what's very fascinating about this kind of same tropical examination of landscape um, gives you many clues and insights into the climate and climate uh, emergency and climate change, but also the poles and the, the equator talk to each other in so many ways. When we think about the Arctic sheets and we think about the rainforest in the Brazilian Amazon, there are many relationships. And I think thinking of this global world, um, we can't always look at our own belt. We have to think about the full sphere. And I love the idea that Lena is taking this top-down approach looking at a polar relationship of land, earth, and water in ways that uh, have always been done by the indigenous communities who circulated in that northern sphere. And I think similarly, we can think about the, uh, the equatorial belt and its plant life and peoples in, in very similar ways. 
So I'm very excited about this talk, which will take us to Alaska, a state I had never been to, uh, territory that extends from the Pacific Rim to the Arctic Ocean, um, thinking about how we change our, our conceptions of material, temporal ideas and space. So very excited to hear this work that you're so invested in, and we're very, very happy to welcome you to the Spitzer School tonight. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, hi everybody. Um, I'm Lena, and thank you, uh, Dean Gutman and Zihao. I think he's somewhere in the Zoom world um, watching us um, for invitation to come here, and also um, Catherine for that amazing introduction that captures my work actually really, really well. So maybe that should be my lecture, <laughs> and then we can go. Um, but anyway, um, I'm going to today talk about my work, um, which is uh, geographically focused in the Arctic, um, as um, both uh, uh, Marta and Kath Catherine mentioned. Um, but I'm going to be a little bit more reflective on the reasons why I'm doing that. And also, as Catherine mentioned, what lessons I am learning from that region and working with people there um, in ways that could be useful for thinking about design and landscape architecture, more particularly um, in the way that we work in New York or Virginia and elsewhere, um, and what we can glean from um, a very interdisciplinary and collaborative work that I uh, tend to do, um, normally with scientists, but also, of course, uh, community members, engineers, social scientists, and you'll hear a little bit more about that as we go on. But I want to first um, open up, let me see if I can drive this really well. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in um, and talk a little bit more about um, what I mean by climate. So much of our conversation today uh, surrounding the topic of climate um, is focused on climate change, and rightfully so. Um, this image of Kivalina, um, as you can see here, right there, um, uh, eroding away to the ocean is one of many, many examples that illustrates the devastating and serious effects of climate change. And in this context, climate is an agency. It is understood by what it does to places and to people, um, as well as their well being and vitality. It is a powerful force that has the capacity to change the direction of the ways in which we live and also understand and connect to landscape. We also understand climate largely as an index, uh, as measured and collected scientific data, simulated and predicted um, by the latest and most advanced technology, like what you see in this image on uh, the supercomputing cluster in NASA for climate simulation. And these two images alone, the Kivalina image and supercomputer, um, together already tell us a, a, a quite a compelling story of climate that we in fact might be most familiar with, um, which is the story of climate change. But they also tell us in a way um, that our, our understanding of climate today is really deeply and also mostly exclusively um, intertwined with climate science. So let me unpack that a little bit more um, and what I mean by that. Um, in Fleming and Yankovic's essay, Revisiting Klima, that's the name of the article, who, by the way, are both historians of climate science, they argue that the modern scientific climatology is really burdened with this enormous challenge of delineating how climate relates to social and economic life. Um, and they point out that the definition of climate, which is in climatology, in climate science, means a statistical average over weather, over a long period of time, often over three decades or so, um, abstracted from the lived experience, our lived experience of climate and constructed rather as a, a, as a um, derived entity. So questions such as, when is climate invoked? Um, where is climate incarnated? How does climate matter and inform the qualities of our daily, um, everyday experience um, cannot be answered by climate science alone. Um, and this shows the limitations of climate science and then our dependency on it in a way. Although, um, of course, science itself provides the critical role in policy, planning, and design of landscapes. But reflecting on our own design processes and then the way that we construct our designed landscape, um, it is arguably very true that we tend to automatically turn to the weather and climate data 
without really questioning what they mean to us culturally um, and look for the means and maps um, and extremes of climate data to determine the size of, for example, the pension ponds, the roads and other types of infrastructure. But here, the question I'm posing um, to the audience um, is does that change how we understand and connect to climate in any different ways than before? Mike Coombe, who is a geographer, picks up on their work and expands it to discuss weather. He reminds us that there is a difference between climate and weather, and that weather has this sense of immediacy and evanescence that climate does not have. And we can understand this pretty intu intuitively too. Climate is what we expect in a way, but weather is what we get every day. <laughs> um, in other words, weather describes this instantaneous and in atmospheric conditions. It is always both passing away and in renewal. Whether it can be seen and felt, um, it is closer to the ground and then where we live in a way. Then Boom defines the climate as, quote, an idea. It's an idea that mediates between human experience of ephemeral weather and the cultural ways of living, which are animated by this experience. He makes the case for the fact that the deep material and symbolic interactions which occur between weather and cultures in places, such as the post-storm artifacts that you see in this image in the background are in fact central to the idea of climate and that we must think much more directly about the weather to recognize that there are many different forms um, of knowing climate, such as through our personal encounters, stories, myths, scientific, as well as creative practices, and so on, across different methods, as well as um, epistemologies. Which gets to um, the third and last quote here for now from a group of sociologists who study the relationship between weather and dwelling um, in the Canadian rain, rain coast. They explain, and I, and I quote, weather like dwelling is a place of sorts, subject to haunting attachment, identification, familiarity, and to the binding powers of imagination, idealization, and narration that is similar to in a way how we understand places, weather as places. Then they conclude that, and this is, I think, really key and has been really informing the way that I do my research and design. And it says, the weather is produced as much as it is experienced. And the processes of how weather is produced are inseparable from how it is experienced. And the question of how weather is produced, therefore, um, and how climate ideas and knowledges are produced culturally then um, is an extremely important question because I think that's when the design can intersect with shaping and producing climate and weather knowledge. So when I combine these three readings uh, from the quotes from these readings together and put them now in the context of climate change, right? Uh, it appears to be that there is a conflict, a bit of conflict. Um, as we understand the climate, primarily as a geophysical system through the lens of climate science and climate change as this large planetary scale crisis, or even you can argue scaleless crisis because it's everywhere, you know, throughout. Um, we are losing, and, and then by the way, which we're singularly subsumed under, right? We're losing, I think, this finer and much more nuanced and variegated grains of what climate is and means to us both individually, but also collectively, um, but also somatically, aesthetically, and so on. And just like how these scholars from various disciplines and perspectives try to define the words climate and weather, um, I think we as designers should be wrestling with these words much more often, um, what they mean, and, and what they could do um, for our design processes. But also the idea of climate, I think is in fact really powerful because it is transcendental. It can be elusive, hard to grasp. It means so many different things to so many people and therefore it resonates with so many of us and, and others. It's a conceptually malleable thing where we as designers can really begin to shape 
and help reveal and identify through a lot of different in a lot of different ways. So I ask myself um, in this age where, as this diagram is showing, our scale, the scales of our environmental knowledges are stretching on both ends, right? We know uh, so many kind of smaller things at the tiny, tiny scale to all the way to the solar systems and galaxies and whatnot. So our environmental knowledges are really expanding uh, about the places that we live, but also elsewhere. How should we as landscape architects and designers translate and reintroduce climate in landscape projects so that they are still informed by the science, but not entirely disembodied from our bodies, ground, and in everyday cultural practices and experience? How do we engage much more directly with climate, but also from time to time, in a way what we call theorist Jody Dean would say anamorphically with climate change. Anamorphically meaning if you look at something directly heads on, you will look appear distorted, but if you look at it from the sideways, you will become much more clear. Um, and also how do we engage with climate, not only as a physical phenomena, but also as ideas and importantly, not always through the lens of crisis, but also through the lens of collectivity, beauty, labor, wonderment, and a positive speculation as the basis for political organization that are um, going to be essential for understanding um, and imagining the future landscape. How do we make sure that even really tiny projects like, you know, roof gardens, small streets, and even temporary design projects that we sometimes doubt um, and question how useful they may be for thinking about the climate change and, and addressing the impacts of climate uh, crisis. How can they still be really meaningful in the way that we think about landscape and climate and our relationships to those things that we cherish? Oh, forgot this. So, um, to my Hume, uh, Hume, going back to his work earlier, um, climate is a set of, set of malleable ideas, and climate change is also more than a physical phenomena to be quote, solved. Um, he notes that instead of resorting to deterministic or purely technocratic narratives of climate change, and I quote, we use the idea of climate change as a reflexive tool to reveal underlying vulnerabilities and biases in society. So he's asking us to use that as a kind of forensic reflective tool um, to rethink and take forward our political, social, and economic projects for years to come. So if the starting point for climate practice is this acknowledgement that climate knowledge comes in many different forms, then we can use landscape architecture and design as a tool um, to shape this, right? And also at the same time uh, as a tool for self-confrontation, um, self-examination, and also collective mobilization in terms of how our relationships to climate and its changes reveal what we can do better as designers and citizens, but also how can we reconfigure some of these very delicate relationships between humans and climate, um, and of course, landscape, uh, to build um, uh, places and communities for, 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 for the future. So all of that <laughs> is how and why my work meets the Arctic. The Arctic also has been considered a geographic periphery for a very, very long time. Um, it's on the edge of the map, at the edge of our imagination and places mo most of us have never been to. Um, and it still is, um, in many ways, a geographic periphery uh, to many people, but now uh, in the age of climate change, sits at this very interesting crossroads. It is in some ways still a periphery, but also at the same time, a forefront of climate thinking, climate practice. It's really sitting at the center of our geographic imagination of extreme climates and climate change. And it has certainly become, over the past decades, a key climatological site, meaning site of scientific research in terms of climate change, um, and also what sociologist Thomas Gearing calls a truth spot. It's, it means a, a place that lends credibility to science and scientific claims, 
in this case, of course, to science of climate change research, given that, of course, the signals of climate change are much more visible and, and stronger um, in, in the Arctic than, than the rest of the places on Earth. But of course, when you hit the ground, uh, you can't simply mask or ignore this overwhelmingly uh, immersive presence of weather and climate. I mean, this is just in September, a couple of years ago. It's not in the wintertime. Um, and it's really a matter of immediate survival, um, but also the Arctic is a place where climate is and has been the critical foundation um, for its vibrant, rich, both the ecological lives, including the inventions and adaptations of indigenous technologies and environmental ecological intelligence that characterizes uh, its diverse landscape, uh, which by the way is a desert, as well as the productions of emerging environmental knowledges, experimentations, as well as sensibilities. So understanding such variegated uh, clues and materialities of the extreme amplified climate can not only give us a sense of renewed view of the many roles and expressions that climate plays and has in society, but also it prompts us to question how else can climate be understood, um, framed, and designed with. One of the ways that climate materializes so viscerally in the Arctic is through the formation of frozen ground. Uh, the picture is a, a kind of section of frozen ground with the ice wedge right there and everything else is frozen. Um, it's really the geoclimatic strata uh, of the Arctic. And then this frozen ground is really uh, uh, the soil or rock that contains some uh, aspect of ice, but because the climate is so extreme there, um, when it freezes and thaws, it creates this enormous hydraulic forces uh, compared to the places that we might be more familiar with. Um, and um, such as, for example, some, something the simplest uh, road, because of the hydraulic forces, it, it kind of pushes things up and, and sinks, expands and cracks, and nothing stays straight and, and, and as originally planned and constructed. So it's no wonder why there aren't that many paved roads, for example, in the Arctic, except for the air uh, landing ships for the airports. But frozen ground also produces a somewhat really unexpected outcomes uh, when you scale up the, 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 the place to talk about the region. This is a map of Alaska. You can see kind of the outline of here. And about 60 years ago, uh, back in March, 1964, when the frost depth was at its maximum, um, one of the strongest earthquakes in recorded history in North America hit this region, uh, oops, about you know, 60 or 70 miles away from Anchorage. And the locals call this um, uh, event the uh, Good Friday earthquake. It was about 9.2 magnitude. So it was a really, really big earthquake and sank and raised over 35,000 square miles of land, which in my own kind of quick lookup, uh, about 65% of the land mass of the state of the New York. Mm -hmm. And you may be actually wondering why I'm mentioning this in relation to climate, um, but hear me out here. Um, according to the CREL engineers, CREL stands for Coal Regions Research and Engineering Lab. It's part of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers research arms dedicated to really researching about the coals, the, both Antarctica and the Arctic. And then they noted in their post-earthquake study that during this incredibly powerful earthquake, and here I quote, the frozen ground had concrete-like properties encasing structures and protecting them from complete destruction. Many houses survived violent shock waves, ground settlements, and landslides. And the presence of frozen water in the underlying sediments also caused the ground to break into rather large seven-foot chunks, like what you see, for example, oops, what you see, for example, here, um, that shifted and tilted, damaging the overlying structures but a lot of these structures, as noted in the, by the Krell, did not collapse immediately, reducing the loss of life. And then the tree is an interesting example or that you know, evidence of that because it's tilted, but still standing. Um, and these are some of the, this is a historic photograph from, from that event, just, just such that the roots are still being held by the frozen ground and the tree is split. 
And a few years ago when I uh, went back, and now it's called the Earthquake Park in Anchorage, it's near the airport. Um, but I found one of the trees that I think is one of the trees that survived through the earthquake uh, because there is a crack and then the tree was still growing. I mean, I don't know, it's, these little things are really fascinating to me. Um, let me see where I was, okay. Um, so the, and then, sorry, hold on. I just got distracted. Um, yes, uh, meaning the, the ground deformation. So in a way, after this, right, um, the earthquake happened, but because the frozen ground, the ground deformation didn't happen until much later when the ground was thawing out, which is a really interesting point because in a way, the frozen ground, the agency of climate, and when it meet with the ground materials, had the agency and power to delay the after effects of, of the earthquake and its impact. And um, the, the post-earthquake uh, reconstruction, of course, um, took many, many years, required years of state and federal um, initiatives to rebuild um, the uh, entire city um, and the state, both physically, but also economically. And as I mentioned, this illustrates the very telling story about climate and its agency uh, with Arctic or subarctic in this case, the Anchorage um, uh, uh, region met with the subterranean constellation of water. It transformed the watery and clayey ground completely so that it sticks to things, hardens and cements things to a level that catalyzed the critical delay that I mentioned at the onset and the aftermath of the earthquake and created this kind of weird geologic crumpled zone, so to speak, that dissipated and redirected the massive tectonic shock. But the climate in the Arctic does something more than changing the material behaviors of the landscape. It also unsettles the Southern and temperate frames of reference that often drives the mainstream spatial and material conceptions and therefore design. This is something that Catherine was alluding to or mentioned before in the introduction. And describing an ice desert, um, Alexander Ponte, a uh, actual theorist, mentions that the land that ceases to be land to become simply soil. Um, she details a sense of deterritoriality of Arctic landscape and complexity presents in cartographic practices. Borrowing from Deleuze and Guattari's concept of smooth space, she quotes, there is no intermediate distance, no perspective or contour. Visibility is limited, yet there is an extraordinary fine topology. It does not rely on points or objects, but on facilities, on sets of relations. Meaning climate is not only weather or atmosphere, but it's really a, a cognitive scaffolding for landscape experience. And similarly to others, including uh, a geographer, Philip Steinberg, the ideals of solid, stable, and superficial land often associated with the term terra, the earth, are also challenged the Arctic environment because the provisional landscape materialities that are neither solid nor liquid, neither land nor water, just like the frozen ocean where you can walk on, or what you see in this image, drifting icebergs that are inhabited, that are, of course, that will be melting away and therefore no longer um, existing, but also that pre-crosses the geopolitical boundaries between, you know, um, uh, the US and Canadian waters and so on, really confounds um, this idea of boundaries and edges and material um, kind of specificity until, of course, such as this melting away into the ocean um, and so on. So operating in Arctic landscapes, and especially doing um, field work and spending time outside in the landscape, therefore, is an encounter with ex extraordinary climates in action. For many of us who are not from the Arctic, including myself, its landscape is full of unfamiliarity. In many parts of the Arctic, including Ukiavik, where my work is usually based, and this is a photo of Ukiavik in June um, last year, um, there are no trees, no parks, no paved roads other than that landing strip in the airport or plaza in a traditional sense that could be 
acting as the orienting device um, for, for many of us in, in, in conventional way, conventional sense. The Arctic landscape challenges established taxonomies of landscapes and ways of knowing, spatializing, and designing them. Instead, cold mud and salt ocean stretch for miles. The sun does not rise for months, while winter temperatures can easily swing from 70 to minus 50 Fahrenheit in just one step out of the building. The Arctic climate and the visceral experience of its elemental landscape in raw, full force often disrupt most sensorial devices, both ours, humans, as well as machines that are largely adapted to southern and temperate latitudes. Skins will frost, pipes will burst, and drones will shiver, even with the slightest neglect. And the supposedly effortless activities such as walking becomes part of a laborious process that requires equally extreme measures for safety and emergency training for visitors. So doing the work in the Arctic, like simply also measuring soil or even trying to put the ground probes into the ground um, also involves tremendous physical labor, um, strong mental and collective will of researchers, but also really importantly, a network of extremely generous and project saving researchers, uh, technicians, strangers, helpers, because at some point instruments will fail, prototypes won't work and fit. And these circumstances require anyone and everyone to be extremely attentive to minute changes in the landscape and its contingencies. In fact, the, this disorienting encounter puts a pause on a lot of fieldwork plans and design ideas, no matter how thoroughly one is prepared for them. Yet, as others have noted, such as Janika Larsen, based out of Norway, um, this overwhelming sense of disorientation during fieldwork and spending time outside in the landscape is also an extremely generative um, for both climate and design thinking because it provides opportunities to crack open our preconceptions in design processes and seek alternative ways of responding to heightened climate experiences. It reveals any, as many limitations as possibilities in tools, methods, perspectives, and worldviews and confronts us with an urgency to question norms of comfort or at least question what we take for granted. Extreme is there already in many cases in the Arctic as an everyday condition, not only as a result of extremely or exceptionally bad weather. The disruption that the Arctic landscape brings also allows us to recognize and take in different climate narratives. As I mentioned earlier in the beginning of my talk, for example, we can meet past climates by entering into the subterranean permafrost where places in age frozen artifacts of plants, bones, ice, and sorts are visible. They also have this very weird musty smell of deep time, um, but that's, that's from this permafrost tunnel, um, which is part of the Krell's research facility in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, but here it's, image of where, for example, the historical and present climates coexist. We also follow, when we're up in Ukiavik, um, Inupiat locals to the caribou Dali tundra, meat-packed ice cellars and underground, um, whaling station, fish drying racks, and other landscapes of subsistence to assemble lived, lived landscape of climate. And here, climate takes on the role of device uh, for animal migration and tracking, um, they are, it, it is also technology to prepare and preserve food. Climate enables Inupia sociologies, um, the source of deep cultural attachment to places. So as the last segment of my talk today, um, I wanna talk about the, some of the things that I'm currently doing um, uh, as part of the um, kind of multi-year research uh, uh, project. Um, it's a five-year project funded by National Science Foundation uh, with COPIs, meaning uh, leaders of the, of the research, um, crossing uh, many different disciplines from environmental sciences, data science, architecture, of course, landscape, uh, engineering, STS, and anthropology, and so on. And you're working also together with two federal research labs, as well as multiple Inupiat um, and tribal organizations, in Alaska and across the North Slope. Um, and at the core, um, we are studying three things. One, how buildings and infrastructure interact 
with the changing surrounding environment. And by the way, this is the aerial for, or the drone footage of Ukiabik in winter time. Um, number two, how design and planning in Ukiabik can benefit from this scientific knowledge on changing natural built interactions. And three, how our very interdisciplinary research team and local residents communicate across disciplines and cultures to arrive at climate knowledge that is meaningful and actionable for, for, for the community. It is a scientific research, of course, um, but it's also a social science and anthropological study. We, as the uh, COPIs, are also research subjects in this particular research. So the social scientists and the anthropologists are studying what we do as a team, but also what designers are bringing to the table in this very kind of collaborative um, uh, research process. But this project also is a design project on climate, climate change, community, and collaboration all at once. And the technological basis for this collaboration is sensor-generated environmental data um, that we're getting from localized dense array of sensors, which is what you see in the bottom side of the, uh, the, the slide, um, as well as geophysical surveys within the town of Ukiatic. And, um, but one of the reasons why I am, that's another image that's uh, coming from my um, design studio that I'm currently teaching with Matthew Jaw about this particular research and we just came back from Ukiabek three weeks ago and it was it was really cold. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons why I am particularly and personally interested in this project uh, and then this project, given the scale of the project has many different facets, many different ways in which we are trying to kind of study uh, the relationship between climate and, and landscape and people but also has many different kind of components, which I'm not going to get into today for the sake of time. But the reason why I am particularly interested in this project, and this kind of goes back to the earlier part of my talk, in that it gives me the proximity to all these people, right? Tundra scientists, military engineers, NUP planners, and so on, so that we can help together contribute to shaping understanding what's actually worth measuring um, as a set of environmental data. Because we need to talk to them, uh, to the community members and stakeholders and leaders. Uh, it's not that we are just going there um, and then deploying the sensors. There has been a, a long and contentious history in the Arctic, but also especially in Alaska where, and they call parachute scientists. They come in, deploy and do whatever they do, want to do and then come out. And the communities are left with the things that no knowledge is retained in the community as well as, of course, there are many other kind of post um, after effects of the colonialist uh, practice in Alaska. But anyway, and, and so kind of what's worth measuring and how to do it, how to go about it, as well as who should be involved um, so that what's measured can already be better calibrated uh, for later use in design and, and planning purposes. And likewise, I think in landscape discipline, but also more broadly in design practice, uh, it could be, you know, arguably true that we're often the consumers of scientific environmental knowledge, right? Um, but if we were to uh, be more conscious and also more deliberate about which climate ideas that we're passing on um, or reinforcing in our design projects, then I think we as designers can be a lot more involved in the processes of creating such knowledge as part of our practice, but also part of what we advocate. And that can include, for example, include, for example, calibrating spatial and temporal scales of environmental data collection that will matter for the human scale as well as scale for design. Also, it can include identifying research and data collection sites that will be helpful for current and future design, planning, and also for maintenance. And all of these, in a way, uh, processes of co-creating knowledge and understanding that there are many different versions of climate as ideas, in a way, uh, uh, shows the importance of the landscape and then also landscape of field work, um, as what um, Honey and Mai Kung say, uh, a site of epistemic exchange. The landscape, when we are doing this kind of work, um, that is, you know, sometimes very contradictory because, you know, what, what environmental scientists might, might um, uh, define landscape will be very different from what we as designers, you know, and, and, and how we work with 
And same thing goes to, you know, the residents who are living there and know the landscape really well. And then their definition of landscape or data or even resilience might be very, very different from how we project and guess and then looks, even if it involves a lot of kind of communication. Um, but this, I think, in a way, is really important because, as I mentioned earlier, we are also research subjects, actually, right? And the social scientist, Caitlin Wiley, who is involved in our project, one day uh, when we were having a meeting, um, told us that, you know, you guys, you guys have a very different ways of working with the idea of landscape and also climate. And maybe you guys should get together and talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, this was, you know, to us. So in there, there was a ecologist, data ethicist, like anthropologist, and of course, architect and landscape architect. And in a way, not because we need to have the same way of understanding what climate is and landscape is, but because it's important in such a collaborative work and also in the way that I lay out my work I talk in the beginning, that these differences really add to the richness of the project. Um, but also knowing where each discipline and each person is coming from um, can really you know, help us to figure out what really matters to us uh, individually, but also for their own work, but also uh, uh, when disciplines and communities are trying to work together. Um, anyway, and, and so perhaps, and this is my last slide here, perhaps also this then further begs the questions such as, where does design begin in an age of climate change and increasing socio-environmental apprehension and awareness? What stages can we set up now as designers, spatial thinkers, and translators directly and anamorphically that can, they can form new synergies and processes for design later on? What partnerships should we build and how can they bridge and expand perspectives and worldviews around issues of climate? And I think all of these variations and ideas will be important, not only in creating a collective climate knowledge and experience, but also in forming new and shared environmental sensibilities. They might one day play an important role in the way we understand and design landscapes. Thank you. I know it's getting late, but I'm happy to take a few questions if you have any. Yeah. Give an example of something you, I don't know if you found anything yet with your probes, but something you might be hoping to find or that you found with a probe and how maybe a couple of different stakeholders yeah. might be dealing with that information. Yeah, so um, we have four different site typologies. Um, and, and first of all, I should maybe back up and say that before we deploy the sensors, which by the way was really complicated because of the pandemic, we the whole field work was delayed a year and a half. Um, so last summer is when we first deployed a set of sensors in the community. But before then, we we're having these multiple meetings with the planning department of North Slope Borough, which is this larger kind of entity that oversees um, the planning of the built environment and permits and so on in the northern part of Alaska. We're also working with um, Tribal Housing Authority, um, provides housing for low-income Inupiat uh, residents and community members. We're also working with ESNA, which basically um, uh, maintains and owns the regional scale hospital. So it's a very important kind of institutional building, but also um, architecturally it's quite different from, you know, house, the house, individual house and so on. And we're also working with BUC, which is this, um, uh, crazy uh, utility headquarters that provides heat, water, you know, uh, treatment systems and so on in that very extreme environment, right? So they are our current main stakeholders and collaborators at the community level. And for example, in the TNHA site, which is the kind of um, the housing authority site, um, uh, we're working with this one of their housing unit, like housing um, uh, building, which has 20 light units, but it's located next to a lagoon. So one of the things that we found with the ground probe is that um, that the uh, the temperature, the ground temperature, and then the ground moisture content don't necessarily behave in the way they would expect because there is so much disruption 
uh, happening through the lagoon process. And there are also pockets of the salts um, that are really throwing off any thermal regimes so that, you know, the part of the building is sinking, you know, then what do you do? Do you have to jack it up or not, right? So it's actually helping to identify some of the kind of, not only the currently kind of subsiding areas, but also, you know, what might happen in future, um, but also informing, because we're also working together with the engineers, um, it's helping them to uh, find a way to kind of lift up the building in, in, in different parts. So that's, that's one way. Another kind of you know example is at the hospital site. I don't have any photo of it here, but strangely, it's kind of built in a polder landscape um, because they did a, a huge fill, um, um, and the building, hospital building, is much much bigger. It looks like a kind of alien ship landing on a tundra. Um, but because it's such a big and heavy thing, they had to you know drive the pile I think forty feet down. As I mentioned before, like it's really, I mean, when we, you know, installed the ground sensors last, last summer, it's summertime, it's, it was in June, and it was extremely hard to drill like, a couple inches. It took us hours and hours and hours. So imagine <laughs> drilling 40 foot down um, for that scale of a building. Mm -hmm. um, and then also because of that, the landscape strategy around that is very different from what you see in the town. Um, therefore, also causing a very different types of thermal regimes in the ground, um, as well as um, uh, kind of how the solar radiation reacts on the surfaces that have been really elevated versus, you know, as part of that kind of sinking, like a, a bowl inside. So these are some of the things that we were looking at. Um, and then we're also looking to add a few more sites based on um, the kind of conversations that we're having with the city people. Um, but also there are kind of residents, you know, who see what we're doing, when we're kind of doing this field work on the street, and then they volunteer, hey, do you, can you, you know, do, you know, this, you know, in my yard, in my house, because my house is not, you know, functioning properly, it's, it seems like it's sinking, it's always flooded. So, you know, we run into kind of these stories and these incidences, and we try to incorporate them, and then, you know, fold it in, and then work with the community members as much as we can. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, I guess like, is the interdisciplinary team at the pool hoping to come away at some point with one cohesive sort of project thesis, whatever, or is everyone sort of there representing their faction, working together, of course, on site, but then hoping to take away mm -hmm. something separately? Yeah, that? yeah. I think it's a really great question. I think it's it's closer to the the second portion that you you probably you described probably because in this kind of setting and also in this extreme environment like nothing goes as planned um so even if you think okay there's a um, technician or scientist who know how to work with the sensors really well they may run into a lot of issues that then require working with other people of other disciplines right so in a way, it's like a hodgepodge of collaboration, so to speak. You know, I'm uh, like, you know, at one point, you know, I am mapping out, you know, it's kind of trying to understand where things are in relation to sensors. Next time I am drilling, you know, trying to dig a hole, you know, into the ground and trying to help them, you know. So it really varies depending on circumstances. And I think that's the messiness of research um, that's closer to reality than what we normally plan out and think that's how it's going to go. Similar to how we do the field work in site visits and design, right? Depending on what kind of people we run into, you know, um, the nature of our research and the field work can really change. Um, but also, you know, in terms of the kind of the, the research outcome, yes, there is, you know, for the scientists, there will be, you know, it's, their disciplinary specific type of research outcome that would happen. Same thing with, you know, for the landscape and architecture side and same thing for the social scientist and anthropologist. But then the, the, that kind of specific respective research and then the content of those, you know, are very much cross fertilized by other disciplines and then in constant dialogue with each other. So that if you're to get rid of one, you know, discipline or one person, 
we're not doing that. Um, then the outcome, the research outcome will be very, very different, I think. And it's that kind of, you know, messy, but also coordinated um, uh, ways of working together um, is what's been really fascinating, but also really hard to do. I mean, interdisciplinary work is much easier to say than actually doing it. Um, and we're learning a lot from that, uh, that process as we're going through. But I think as designers, you know, we should be, we, sh we should be experiencing, you know, and we should be learning, we should be doing more of this so that, you know, we can address um, the larger issues of climate change and social justice and environmental justice and so on um, in the way that resembles how actually the world works rather than being siloed into one discipline. Like I think that cross-disciplinary and collaborative work is a really important and timely methodology that we as designers should embody and embrace. All right. Yeah. I, I was wondering what what brought you to the art tech? How did you what how did you get there? Yeah, it actually I, I get asked the question sometimes. Um it's a good question. Um actually my very first trip to the Arctic and my research trip was when I was a student when I got a very, very small grant. It was like thousand dollar, you know, to go up to Ukiabe. And this was back in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been going back and forth, you know, to Ukiabe, the same place since then. Um, but around the time it was the International Polar Year, uh -huh. um, 2008 or so, 2007, 2008. Um, and it was my first year, second year studying landscape architecture. And sure, like, in, you know, you're doing your studio, history classes and plants class and so on. And then in the background, in like news and newspapers, I always kind of hear about what's happening in the Arctic. Um, and then in part, I was curious about it and also trying to be like, okay, what's really happening, you know, venturesome. But so we got that grant went, went up. And then the, the research proposal was, I think, in hindsight, very naive. It was, it was to um, study the, the perception of landscape um, during the week of first sunrise after, after winter. Because, you know, of course, in the wintertime, they don't have the sun above the horizon. Um, and it was really like one of the most anticlimactic sunrise experience I've ever had. It was like so cold. It was like, I don't know, like minus 50 Fahrenheit, like the freezing with camera, like, you know, it's kind of, it was really windy and it was like a bluey, weird, you know, uh, kind of light, you know, thing. And we're standing there, and this is also with Matthew. Um, and so we're standing there and then waiting for the sun to rise. And then it w came up just above the horizon, just like tip of it. And then like, you know, three minutes later, it just went back down. And that was it. And then for that moment, we flew from, I don't know, East Coast, all the, it was very disheartening. But at the same time, I was realizing through that experience of standing and waiting for the sun um, in the, you know, in the, tun in the in tundra, um, just really kind of exposed me to what this extreme climate and weather situation can do to you both you know in a kind of as a perceptual as perceptually but also physically uh you wander you know you can really think straight um you need a car all the time um which by the way is another topic we can I can get into but um and then you know we went into a pizza hut to find food um and that's where um I saw on a table there's a placemat and there are like children's drawing that said um, no more drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the introduction yeah. to the Arctic for me, you know, staying out in the tundra looking for the sun and coming into a pizza, I mean, pizza hut, you know, yeah, like pizza hut, um, to really be just confronted with the actual social and cultural realities um, that many people experience. Um, so then that then snowballed, well, okay, snowballed yeah. into. Um, what it is now, but it's really that kind of, you know, realizing that there are so much more to this place than what I initially thought and have imagined from distance. Um, so that's that's what kept me kind of going and, you know, kind of keep looking into it. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have a question. So I love the drawing, I think it was from your research group that looked at local microclimatic 
adaptations to the weather, right? And mm -hmm. it was usually producing heat, like fog catchers or compost underneath the chicken coop. Mm -hmm. And I think that's from your research group drawing. So yeah. I'm curious, like how, what kind of, I, I love the idea of like climate versus weather, like mm -hmm. this macro global thing versus a very local. And then seeing that drawing also thinks about like, you know, it's a big cold region, but there are these tiny interventions that yeah. found impact. I'm yeah. curious in that kind of massive scale leap from global to very specific, yeah. tiny, yeah. what takeaways do you have or what, what comes to you with yeah. that kind of local knowledge locally yeah. produced in the weather? So yeah. curious, like, what kinds of things or relationships have you seen yeah. uh, elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I think um, kind of general climatic trends and patterns that for example scientists might see, um, in general, work together with what indigenous and Inuit people might observe mm -hmm. um, just by their body, you know, perceptual mm -hmm. observation. Um, but then the stories that come out are, can be quite different. Um, for example, many this is actually many years ago, not based out of Reykjavik, but in Shishmarak, which is in the west coast of Alaska, where their um, the community members have been trying to relocate the town for the past four decades and. Mm -hmm still can't can do it uh, for many different reasons. But one of the reasons why, why the relocation move um, was not or hasn't been successful is because the climate change and the relocation discourse really kind of misses on the importance of understanding climate as the basis of their subsistence. So how do you follow caribou? Where do you find them? You know. How do you attract whales? Um, all of the kind of lived experience of understanding climate is a kind of larger, longer scale phenomena, but also on the ground this season and today, tomorrow. Like, how do you track um, these other living beings based on observing this local weather phenomena? And then, how, what they might mean in terms of you know, being able to bring food in for the community and also being able to continue their treatment and so on, right? So there is still a gap between understanding the larger climate, but also the localized area, like aspects of, you know, kind of how this, you know, they all come together. Um, but in, in terms of scientific research, I mean, there is and has been um, a, quite a bit of a uh, long history in terms of collaborating between Nubit uh, residents and also scientists. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, it has a long contentious history. Um, but a lot of times these days, um, many of the research kind of you know, prompts and you know, projects really try to redefine and, and kind of support the relationships so that not only you know, um, scientific kind of institutions as well as the kind of knowledge producing machines, so to speak, um, uh, can really benefit the communities, but also um, you know, the ways in which we understand climate and weather in a way epistemically can kind of be bridged better as well. Yeah. Other questions? All right, go to the art, I guess. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. so much. Yeah. <laughs> Well, just to say that our lecture next week is happening on